Hey everyone, welcome back to another build log where I try to recreate a $600 Dyson task light using off-the-shelf and 3D printed parts. In this build log, I'm moving on to arguably the most critical component of the lamp, the lighting element. And I'll show you my thought process in selecting the right LED, the way that I plan to cool the LED, the electronics I'll need to power it, and also my approach for mounting it all to the horizontal arm. I think on the surface, finding the best LED for the job seems straightforward. You want something with a high CRI, right? So you sort by CRI, you find the LED that's in your power range, that's in the size that you want, and you pick that LED, stick it on the lamp. But unsurprisingly, it's uh, quite a bit more complicated than that. It's not just the LED that we need. We need a bunch of different components that come together to make up a usable, workable, high quality lighting system. These are high precision, high power LEDs, and they need very specific components to make them work. So for example, they need uh, heat resistant housings if you want to mount them anywhere. They need precisely tuned electronics so that you can power them. And you need specifically dialed in optics to get them to focus focus and diffuse correctly. All of these components need to work together to make a good light source. You know what it reminds me of is that riddle where there's a fox, a rabbit, and a cabbage, and you need to get them across the river in a single boat. And if you combine the fox and the rabbit, the fox will eat the rabbit. If you combine the rabbit and the cabbage, the rabbit will eat the cabbage. Finding a perfect combination of parts is kind of like that. Even if you find what you think is a perfect LED, you can't use it if there aren't the correct corresponding electrical components and mounting components and optics. So the task here is to take the thousands of LEDs that are on the market and narrow them down to meet our specific requirements. We want one that's around 1,000 lumens in brightness, anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500 is fine. Uh, the power rating of that is gonna be around 10 watts generally, so that's what we're looking for. As I've said in earlier videos, I also wanna maximize the color rendering index or the CRI, so as close as I can get to 100 would be great. Uh, typically in the 90 to 100 range is pretty good. And the last factor that's just around the quality of light is the color temperature. So there's a, a range of options there too. I'm thinking on the warmer side, warmer to neutral, so 3000 to 3500K. Now it's about taking those thousands of LEDs and narrowing it down to a smaller set of options that works with all the other components that we need. A really important component we need is this, an LED housing. And there are a wide range of sizes and specifications for these housings, um, but not every LED has a corresponding housing. But just by having this one compatibility constraint, you take those 10,000 LEDs that you had before and you narrow it down significantly to probably under 100 LEDs that could work. But even once you've done that, uh, you're, you're not even close to being done yet. Uh, you have the socket, but like I mentioned before, the optics that are paired with an LED are a really important part of the whole package. And so you better hope that the socket that you've selected is compatible with some sort of optics like a lens or a diffuser. So what we're talking about is a lens like this that is specifically designed to work with not only your socket, but the LED that you've chosen. So the LED needs to be compatible with the socket and the socket needs to be compatible with the lens, which also needs to be compatible with the LED. None of these parts are made by the same manufacturer. There seems to be some communication between them, but um, finding the right combination of these things is a kind of a guessing game. It's just trial and error for hours and hours. Uh, luckily, I've done a lot of that trial and error and shopping around to find a combination of these three parts that work well together. Uh, so I have this LED, which is is a 16 by 19 millimeter LED at all the specifications that we talked about before. Pretty high quality, really nice LED. It's made by LumaLeds. Pair that with a socket that's designed to fit 16 by 19 LEDs in it. And lastly, I have this lens diffuser combo that is specifically designed to work with this socket, which is important because uh, they just twist together. And once you've found a pairing of these components that work well together, you've come a really long way, but you still need to be able to power the LED. And that's where this comes in. This is a power supply that's made specifically for LEDs. This one happens to be a 300 milliamp power supply. So it supplies a constant current of 300 milliamps. And that is exactly what this LED needs. It took a really long time to find the perfect combination of these. I'm actually still shopping for an even better solution. I'm still shopping for an LED that has the ability to uh, vary its color temperature programmatically so that I can replicate the feature of the Dyson lamp where it reads the light temperature in the room and replicates it in the lamp. I think that'd be really cool, but for now, I think this is a really good solution.
Luckily, cooling is a little bit simpler. I was able to find a heat pipe that works absolutely perfectly for this application. This is just a standard copper heat pipe. There's a bunch of variations that you can buy on Mouser. Actually, I should just grab those. So they come in a variety of sizes. You can get them in different lengths and different specifications. They all basically do the same thing, just draw heat away from the LED. And this was my final choice. The process was really simple for finding this one. The determining factor was just what fits in the profile of the horizontal arm the best. And this one is so perfect that the choice was clear. The missing piece here is I need to find a way to mount the LED directly to the heat pipe so that the heat can transfer out um, and then mount that to the lens assembly. So to achieve this, I have a custom part that I designed to both hold the LED assembly together and also mount that assembly to both the heat pipe and the horizontal arm. And now to mount the whole thing to the horizontal arm, I can just slide the heat pipe into the aluminum channel and uh, this threaded hole here can now be used to mount it pretty securely. Eventually I'll add some thermal adhesive between the heat pipe and the aluminum channel to maximize cooling efficiency and also just to keep it more secure. In theory, the final step would just be to secure the lens in place. Uh, so this is what the final uh, construction would look like, but one of the tabs on this lens actually broke, so it, it just comes right off. Uh, but you get the idea, kind of looks like that. And I plan to design a little housing that goes around the whole thing and, and covers all this stuff up, but that's the general idea, it'll look like that. This little custom part is doing a lot of work right now, and right now it's just made out of PLA. Uh, that won't do for the final de design. Trust me, I've done some testing with PLA touching the LED or even being close to the LED, uh, like in this proximity, uh, and the PLA just melts, P PETG just melts as well. Uh, it needs something like polycarbonate uh, or even metal. And my plan is to use a professional digital fabrication service like uh, Shapeways and get this part printed out of steel, which is why it looks a little bit weird. I'm trying to minimize the total volume to keep costs down with that professional 3D printing service. So I've managed to optimize this to the point where it's about uh, $20, I think, to get this printed. I've actually gotten a few samples back from Shapeways already on this part. Um, so this is a, a steel part actually, but the process of getting these dialed in is a little bit tricky. There's a lot of shrinkage on parts like this. So when I tried this part, it had shrunk enough that uh, the holes are too small for the screws, so here and here, and also this slot is too small for the heat pipe. Uh, so I tried a different material. They have a new material that's uh, actually stainless steel, um, and it's really cool. It's a super precise uh, finished part. I'm really happy with this, but um, I think they're still working out some of the kinks in this process because uh, the whole part is, is warped. So neither of these are going to work. Uh, I have a couple more options on the way. For now though, I'll be using the PLA part. Just have to be careful not to melt it. I'm thinking the shroud that goes around this will actually cover up the lens so you won't see it. Uh, but here's an idea of what, what it looks like all together. Something like this. Okay, I think I'm ready to finally power the LED up. And to do that, I need two components. One is this driver, which I mentioned earlier. That's just for regulating the power that goes to the LED. And the other component is for controlling the brightness. And for that, I have this Adafruit Trinket M0. And with this, I can actually write code that will talk to the driver and control the brightness of the LED. Eventually, I want to be able to control the brightness with a couple of buttons here near the LED. But first, I just want to make sure that my combination of controller and driver are working to power the LED and that I can adjust the brightness program Automatically. I've connected one of the digital out pins on the trinket to the PWM pin on the driver, and that should allow me to send a signal from the board to the driver and control the brightness of the LED. For this test, I'll use this little Adafruit script that cycles the LED from minimum brightness up to maximum brightness and then back down. I have my bench top power supply set at 12 volts, uh, so 12 volts will go to the driver. So let's plug this back in and fire it up. All right, so that is, is exactly what I expected to see. So you can just see it's cycling from zero to 100 very quickly. Um, you can see the power that's being drawn from the power supply uh, uh, fluctuate as that happens. Um, and I think with that, we can conclude that the microcontroller is communicating with the driver perfectly and passing that power along to the LED, which is making it uh, dim, which is great. So next step, is one, stop this so that the PLA doesn't melt. But also after that, I want to add in functionality where you can uh, increase or decrease the brightness using a button. So I'm gonna add that now. 
Luckily, as I was programming the microcontroller, the replacement lens arrived. So now I can mount this and test out the optics as I'm testing the electronics. So in order to control the brightness, I need to add a pair of buttons here. So I've added one to increase the brightness and one to decrease the brightness. Those are wired up to a couple of the digital out pins on the microcontroller. And then I need to update my code to make that possible. So what I have here is a couple of things. One is um, I've just added support for my two buttons up here and then set a couple of uh, parameters. So uh, the step uh, variable defines how big the brightness increase and de decreases are. So this is about, uh, right now it's 25% of the total brightness. Uh, so four steps will get you to max brightness. Uh, and then the brightness defines how bright the LED is at any given point. So when you turn the LED on, it's gonna be 25% and then it will increase and decrease from there. And then this is the main control for uh, increasing or decrease, decreasing the brightness. Uh, so it will just listen for either button. If it detects that you're pressing the brightness increase bu button, uh, it will add 25% to the brightness up to 100. Once it gets to 100, it will obviously stop trying to increase the brightness. And then same for the brightness decrease button. Uh, once it gets to zero, it'll stop trying to decrease that. So I can actually just uh, run this in real time now. Um, I have it hooked up um, and my power supply is ready. Um, it's actually running right now. Uh, I kind of forgot, but um, I can bring my little lamp down here. And uh, once I push this button, it's currently at 0% uh, brightness, which is why it's not pulling hardly any power. Uh, but if I push the brightness increase button, it'll go up to 25%. You're seeing a lot of flicker on camera, but that's just a camera effect. We're at 75% brightness now, and now we're at 100. Another thing I did is, um, added some functionality so that it prints to the serial log as you press these buttons. So if I press it again, um, it'll show me that it's not actually trying to increase because I'm at 100. And if I go down, it'll tell me that I'm going slowly down to zero. So now the lamp is off. I can prevent this flickering by changing the frequency that the um, PWM is working at. So right now it's a very low frequency. It's at uh, only 100. So to uh, possibly get rid of that flicker, I'm going to try to increase this up to 5,000. And I can save that. There we go, it looks like it's working now. So with that frequency change, uh, there's no more flicker on camera, it looks a lot better. The next thing I'd like to do is add a fade animation between brightness levels, but that's an optimization I'm going to save for another day. Okay, so what's next? I think that's about it for this video, but I wanted to document the process of selecting the components, putting them together, and programming something that shows that this actually is a functioning light. And I think we've done all of that. Uh, it's a pretty time consuming process, but um, I think we have a lot of proofs of concepts done now. I think one of the main next steps is to miniaturize all of this and try to find a way to fit it onto the lamp itself. Um, that's gonna be pretty tough, but should be fun. I'm thinking what makes sense for the next video is to try to miniaturize this, put it into some parts and get it officially mounted onto the lamp. Uh, that would be a great step. And then also I have a couple of small updates that will come with the next video as well. Some of you have been asking for access to the 3D models for this project. So those are available now. There's a GitHub link in previous videos that you can access and also this video, of course. So head over there to get the latest files. The code for this is also in the GitHub page. So you can find that there. And those will all be updated as the progress continues. And that's gonna do it for this video. Uh, thank you so much for watching. If there's anything that I've covered and you want me to cover in more depth or something I haven't covered that you want me to touch on at all, uh, please let me know in the comments because I can, I can talk about any of this stuff, um, kind of just putting together what seems interesting to me. So your feedback is totally appreciated on that one. Subscribe if you wanna see more and I'll see you in the next video.